I, I just want to remark that without Peter and Eric, um, Peter Tosh and Eric, the tech guy, none of this would ever happen. Um, and they don't get to be up on the stage much, but they're certainly a um, really strong part of this program. So I just want to say thank you to you. <laughs> and it's fitting because our town, as a lot of you know, it's about finding out about the people that make St. Petersburg such a rich and important and wonderful place to live. And the reason our town got started is because um, I realized that there were a lot of people, like me included, who don't know who the people are that make things happen. You might recognize them, but you really want to know who are they? What are they like as people? Um, you know that they may wear a hat as an executive director or some rich person or a mayor, but they must be people like us. <laughs> um, so we'd like to get to know them. So that's why this is here. And my guest tonight, Linda Osmondson, who's the executive director of CASA, um, is somebody that isn't, doesn't have a position that's flashy like a mayor. You know, they're not out in front all of the time. But it's people like Linda Osmondson that really does help to make our town a place that we feel good living in and that a lot of people benefit immensely from. And without something like CASA and people like Linda, we would have a less rich town. And maybe St. Petersburg wouldn't even be um, what it is today and what it's going to be soon. So with that, um, please help me welcome Linda Osmondson. Thank you, Carol. I must say that um, before I ask my first question that I always ask, the way that I met Linda Osmondson, <laughs> my husband Robert Stackhouse and I um, purchased, uh, we live in a commercial building. We're artists, as I think most of you know. And we had just moved in, and we were having a bit of an open house with a few people we knew in the area. And Linda lived in our neighborhood, and she would walk. At that time, I don't think you were riding a bicycle. I think you were walking and jogging. And she just knocked on the door, and she said, well, I've always liked this building, and I'm wondering what sort of people would buy it. So. <laughs> I'm coming in. <laughs> we said, okay. So I crashed the party. Yeah. And we've known each other ever since. And, and you received as a benefit from that a whole big thing of ice cream oh, that yes, we got. Oh, yes, we did. We took, took to, to, the, to the women at the shelter. That was wonderful. I remember that now. Yeah. So anyway, um, the first question I always ask my guests are, how did you come to St. Petersburg? Well, I'll give you the short version. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, and I shared that with, shared some turquoise with some people in your audience. And um, then my family moved to California when I was uh, about 12. And so I went to high school and college there. And then after that, I had just really never been anywhere in my whole life. So I started taking jobs in different places. Uh, and usually a year or two. So I lived in San Jose, California. I lived in Santa Cruz, California. And then I moved, moved to Denver, Denver, Colorado. I lived in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. I lived in Chicago. Um, and let's see, and, and all, so between all those, I kept going back and forth to California where my family lived. And then I got a job in Florida and um, started in West Palm Beach and then um, took another job in uh, Gainesville and then ended up in St. Petersburg kind of by accident because I came to work for CASA. So that was a pretty circuitous route of moving around the country, sort of getting to see the part of the country and sort of uh, feeding my travel lust since I'd never been anywhere um, until I grew up. It was kind of fun to see what other people lived like and what other people, what kind of communities. I'd never really lived in a big city until I, oh, I lived in Boston for a number of years. So it was fun. 
So you've been here the longest. Yes, I've so, been here longer than anything, actually 23 years now. So what is it about St. Pete that kept you here? Well, I must say 23 years ago when I moved here, I was 23 years younger. <laughs> <laughs> and when I first came here, I um, looked around and I thought, oh my goodness, this is an interesting place. I'm much younger than most of the people who live here. <laughs> much younger. <laughs> well, of course, I've uh, matured. And I'm not much younger any longer. Um, but, but um, you know, St. Petersburg, I used, it was very quiet when I first moved here. And I was kind of wondering, oh, my goodness, where did I come? This is interesting. But it began to grow on me. And, uh, and as I, I sort of feel like I've been part of the development of St. Petersburg over the years. I, I just have so many interests that I've you know, participated in. And when they were doing the going through and changing all the zoning codes, I participated in some of those meetings. And when you know, all the decisions that have been made over the years, I've participated in those things. I'm involved in Tiger Bay, for instance, so I'm, I'm always interested in what other people think and how people do things, and so I feel like I've been a part of the town growing, and it's been pretty fun. Hmm. You know, I think some people would be curious about why you would um, have a job mm -hmm. uh, working for an organization like CASA, which... Um, means that you see an underbelly of mm -hmm. the city that a lot of us don't see. So why have you chosen to have a job like that? You know, it's interesting. My early jobs, and I moved about every two years, I kept wondering what my career was going to be, and so did my mother. Um, in fact, she could never really quite tell people what I did this week. Um, but you know, all the things that I did were really building towards the work that I do today. I, you know, I worked in journalism. I worked with kids. I worked in low-income housing. Um, I worked selling solar systems. I actually worked as a mover um, for a while. I mean, moving furniture. I had a moving company for a short time. But all those things actually came together um, when I've had my first domestic violence job. And then I also married when I first moved to Florida and over some years figured out that that relationship I was abusive and lived and worked in an abuse in, in a, an abusive relationship working in an abuse program kind of you know kind of dealing with that kind of difference there going to work in the day looking trying to look professional and staying up all night because you're being abused um, was a pretty big conflict in my life and it took me a little while to put a name on it um, like it takes many survivors of domestic violence and so um, all the things, the pieces in my life really kind of came to this program that was, was part of my life. And I had all these pieces that fit into what I was doing. And I realized, okay, this is what I want to do. You know, so my first job was in West Palm Beach, then in Gainesville, and then, then here. And it just, it just brought everything together. I think I figured out that I could wear the feminist label, label and not feel uncomfortable with it any longer. And, you know, people, some people think I was born with that label. Um, I actually wasn't born with it. Um, I, I really claimed it at some point in my life when I figured out what that meant to me. So, you know, it's been a growing progress over many years of sort of figuring things out um, kind of on my own. Um, maybe you could say what CASA stands for, C-A-S-A. -A, so. Um, some of you that have been here a really long time will remember the Center Against Spouse Abuse. I think, Katie, you probably remember that. Um, but we, we uh, looked at that name and realized that many of the people we served were not legal spouses. And, um, so, and we didn't want to be something that was against something all the time. So our, our name now means Community Action Stops Abuse. And it, it just sort of came out of a strategic planning session we had one time. Because we wanted to keep CASA because that was what we were known by. And it sort of meant house in Spanish. But we want it to be something more, we want it to be something bigger, something that, that really involved the whole community. And, and that name came out, and it seems like it fits for us. Because, you know, domestic, we always think of domestic violence as is, is a woman's problem, a secret problem. But it's really a community problem. Mm -hmm. And almost all of us are affected by the effects of domestic violence if you start to think about it. One of the reasons I like the name CASA, and it's one of your... I don't know if it's your vision statement or what it is, but it says everyone deserves a safe home. Yes. 
So the casa really makes you mm -hmm. think about a home. And that, that really speaks to me because mm -hmm. um, I've once had my home broken into when I was there. And that sense of your home being violated, it's terrible. it shakes you. And if you lived in a home where you never felt safe, what was going to happen to you. There's something very necessary about having a very safe place that you can go to when the world always sends you some things that are not easy to go. And I'd like to think about what a difference it would make in our society and how many other social problems it would affect if every child and every adult lived in a home that was safe and nurturing. Think about that, if you will. If every child grew up in a home that was safe and nurturing, we probably would have a lot less drug abuse. We would have an awful lot less crime. We would have a lot less young women becoming pregnant at 13 and 14 years old trying to have a family. We would have fewer teens joining gangs because, again, that's kind of like a family. That's a, a place that you want to belong. Um, we would have a lot I, I'm sure that we would have fewer, less suicide, you know, and I think one interesting statistic is that about 80% of the women who are in prison today are there directly or indirectly because of domestic violence. We don't have a correlating statistic for men, but my guess is that many, if not most, of the men in prison today grew up in homes where they saw violence or were, were violated themselves. So, so think about the numbers of social problems that stem from children who are growing up in homes where they're not safe, where they worry about going to school and wondering if mom's going to be alive when I get home. If I'd only stayed at home today, mom wouldn't have died. Can you imagine what that'd feel like? Mm -hmm. Imagine worrying about that? Many of us can't imagine it. But for those who do and have lived in that kind of a home, think, you know, those children aren't doing real well in school. Mm -hmm. You know, those children are the ones that are beating up your kid. Those, those children are the ones that, that are angry. Those kids, kids are the ones that, that are ill. Those kids are the ones that are suffering from all kinds of physical problems. Those are all things that stem out of domestic violence. So if we can get a handle on, figure it out here, and it's learned behavior. It's not, nobody's born, no child is born being violent. But, you know, um, when you're a kid, even when you're an adult, you don't think, oh boy, you know, I'm going to grow up to be someone who hurts somebody. Or I can't wait to, you know, be an abused spouse or something. So it's what I'm saying is it's not anything I can imagine that anybody wants to be. Like you may want to be a doctor or you may want to be an artist or a museum director or a nurse or whatever. But you don't think about doing that. So why is it so prevalent? I mean, why... Is it something people choose, or is it just something that you learn, or you brought up to act that way? How do we explain the the how prevalent it is? Well, I think it's a multitude. First of all, we know that most abusers grew up in homes where there was violence, or they were victims of violence themselves. We also look at the media and the you know rampant violence in the media. So um, we look we look at. Uh, it's still acceptable in our society to hit children. You know, if you think about it, who is still legal to hit, we call it spanking, and so we have a nice name for it. But in fact, what we're telling children is that, well, when you grow up to be big like me, um, you can hit, hit people too. It's okay. You know, um, you can hit people who are smaller than you are. That's what parents do when they hit their children. They're big people hitting small people. You know, the message we're telling, the messages we give to children are that there are certain instances where violence is okay. If you, you know, we've done a number of surveys in college age classes, you know, where you ask young men, are there times when it's okay to hit somebody else, a girlfriend? And, you know, a significant number of young men say yes. There are times because it's still how we value women. It's still how we value children that we have to really work on. If we could figure out how to see women as, you know, the Chinese proverb, women hold up half the sky, if we could figure that out and, and acknowledge the fact that women have 
an equal, maybe different role, but an equal role in our society, an important role in our society, then we wouldn't give latitude to being able to use violence to discipline them, uh, dominate them, um, make them afraid, so on. Well, we know that um, there's this big thing going on now. It's in the news a lot about the um, abuse that we see in the military. And people are really trying to address that. Even people you wouldn't mm -hmm. expect are really outraged about this. So to me, even though it shows more evidence that there's more abuse in the military and primarily against the women in the military, it says to me that people are willing so much to talk about it and to actually try to do something about it that this looks like a good thing. Is that how you see it? Well, I do. I mean, you know, finally somewhere, you know, it's interesting, the military was really the forerunner when we were dealing with race. The military was probably the one of the very first government organizations that integrated itself racially. Well, so now finally the military is integrating itself by gender. Mm -hmm. And um, so it now gives us sort of the opportunity to say, well, then why are women often the spoils of war, for instance? What happens when somebody wins a war? And, you know, it goes back to the times of the Bible. Well, we get to take their women. You know, and how do you, how do you humiliate a man? Well, you take his woman. And I notice I'm saying his woman. So it's, it's, it's a sense of ownership because in, those, mm -hmm. in, in that kind of experience, it is that women are, are owned by men. Um, that thinking that women are owned by men um, is still exists in our society. And you know, when I talk to young people who can't imagine being as old as I am, um, that, you know, <laughs> I say, you know, I'm old enough that my grandmother was born before women had the right to vote. I'm old enough that my mother was born when women had no right to represent themselves in court, had no right to, to sign a, a legal document, had many, you know, um, and, and that I was born before women had the right to have, sign, have a credit card, you know, without my father or my husband signing on it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we aren't so far away from a society that, that believed that women were secondary citizens, were chattel, were property that were bought and purchased. And so, you know, to still to some men, that marriage license is, well, I bought you and I own you now. And we have to really change that <laughs> thinking. <laughs> I know for some of you women here, that's pretty much of a, and for me right now, it certainly is, is an indignity, but it is something, it was a, it's a belief that, that still there are men out there and it's still reinforced by some religious beliefs, mm -hmm. you know, so our, so why wouldn't we expect it to bubble up in the military um, where um, you have people in close quarters and still there are men who are men and women who are told, well, get control of the situation, you've got to be powerful, you've got to, you know, and it's either fight or die. Um, there's still this sort of thing that, well, I deserve to be able to take the woman who is weaker than I am. Weaker only in certain ways. We're not necessarily weaker in many ways. We're not even physically weaker in many ways. Only certain ways. And so, and you know, I can always get a bigger gun and nobody's then stronger than me. You know, I could, I often use for when I'm talking again with children, if I stood here with a big gun, you all would probably polish my shoes if I wanted them polished um, for a while. Now, because there are more of you than me, eventually you would figure out how to overpower me and I would lose. But for at least the short run, that gun works. Um, so it's just the same as that fist works for the short run. But everybody has to go to sleep sometime. You know, and women do defend themselves. Mm -hmm. And but, do you want to live in a society where you're afraid of your mate? Do you want to live in a society where, where if I go to sleep, I'm afraid she'll do something to me? Well, I certainly wouldn't want to do that. And of course, women have lived in that kind of environment forever. So how? I take it there are men who are also um, abused spouses. Not as many. You are, and, and many gay men. There's quite a lot of violence that goes on in gay and lesbian relationships. 
um, because of the power imbalance that still exists in our society, because we still earn, you know, what, seven, I think it's 79 cents now instead of 71, um, but we still earn less as, as um, women in our society. We, you know, there's, there's still an imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not so often that women are going to hit a man. Now, there are, not, there are women who are not very nice out there. Um, and, but men have more choices in terms of leaving them. They have more economic choices than, than they, they have many more choices than women do. So the sort of control, the, the battered woman, there's really, I don't see, there are women who are not very nice. There are men who get hit, but most men are not terrified and captured in the way that men, are, that women are in relationships where they're being dominated by a male partner. So, so a lot of the discussion so far, you've been wearing your executive yeah. director hat. How does all of this affect you as Linda? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. You know, um, living in an abusive relationship for a really long time and working in a, an abuse organization sort of was a pretty lonely time because the place where one would naturally go for help, well, it really wasn't available to me because I would then have to admit that you know, I was a survivor or a victim of domestic violence. So that was a lonely time. You know, when I got out of that relationship, I think um, I really realized and have always realized the need for this work. Um, but I buried myself in that work for a really long time until, you know, I sort of figured out that one needs a bit of balance in one's life. You know, um, there was always a church for me that kind of, I, I was raised in a very religious family and I've lived and I've had that religious underpinning that kind of, it kept, both kept me in that relationship probably too long because I was going to love the hell out of him. Um, I was going to somehow heal him, you know, and, um, you know, God had a better plan for me. Um, so I got lifted out of that relationship, thank goodness, I mean, and literally almost lifted out of that relationship. Um, and I began to figure out that I needed balance in my life. And um, somebody, you know, showed me this thing called a bicycle um, that I'd ridden when I was younger and had, not you know, thought about a bicycle for a really long time. And a couple of my women friends were going on this adventure called Bike Floor. And I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> and so I did. Um, I rode for a week on a bike, and I kind of fell in love with biking. And, you know, the first week I rode on a bike, I was riding a an old Astro Daimler that's very heavy. It's a 10 speed. I didn't know that there were lighter bikes and that they were fancier and that they had more gears and all those things. But um, I learned all of that and, you know, just sort of fell in love with biking. And that kind of helped me have something else going in my life. I ended up biking across the country a couple of years after I'd started biking again. And I remember sitting in the group. From San Francisco to New Hampshire. Yeah. I know. Well, I remember when you did that. Yeah. Um, you know, and sitting around this group of mostly guys, I, there were 20 people that did it all together, four women, and the rest were men. The other three women were PE teachers, and then there was me. Um, <laughs> a little intimidating, and, um, you know, the, all the guys and everybody else were saying, I had been dreaming about this all of my life, and I sort of said, oh... Well, um, I've been riding a bike for about a year, and I thought this sounded kind of cool, and so I do it. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you, the first two or three days of it, I thought, boy, I've made a really bad mistake. And how this old is, were you when you did that? Um, I was uh, 57 years old when I rode across the country. Um, and, um, yeah, really old. Um, <laughs> but... You know, it was a freeing, liberating experience. You know, after three or four days, you know, you start in San Francisco. I live here. I've lived here for 23 years. Flat. It's flat. <laughs> you know, most of you have been to San Francisco. It's not flat. Well, then it goes up from there, you know, as you go in through, through you know, Reno and you go through Colorado. Um, you know, so... The first few days, I thought, I have really made a bad mistake. <laughs> um, but, you know, being the stubborn woman that I am, I thought, well, I'm going to just keep, I promised I was going to do this. And I, um, you know, it got better. It got a lot better, in fact. And it was a, it's a wonderful way to see the country, you know. Mm. Every blade of grass at, the same at, at a time, you know, every, every roadkill at the same time <laughs> you know you see every bit of roadkill and you're right in there in it you smell it you see it it's right up close um you know you uh 
see lots of cars, you know, you're riding through, you know, one of the most amazing things was riding through the salt flats mm. um, in around um, Salt Lake City. Mm. You know, that you would drive through that on a car at 80 miles an hour, right. you know, on a bicycle at 15 or 16 miles an hour. Um, it's this shimmery, beautiful, most amazing, very surreal kind of, a, feel like you're on, a moon, on the moon. Um, you know, this incredible experience, all these colors you see up close. It just, it's a marvelous experience. And we had, you know, every state had its personality. You, know, you could tell when you cross a state line by the condition of the road that was different. You could tell, you know, um, all kinds of different things, the personality of each state. Uh, it was wonderful to see that really up close. Did your really body? Close. Did your body ache? Did you suffer any injuries? I mean, um, you just could ride that whole way, and you weren't like, "Give me a massage." Or <laughs> well, yeah, there were days when you wanted those, um, and days when we actually got those. But mostly, it was just. I've always had a very strong, you know, um, one of the best compliments I get. We had four guys that were retired. Um, they were retired military Air Force guys and they helicopter pilots and one of the best compliments i ever got is that you know one of the guys said you were mentally the toughest woman i've ever met <laughs> and i thought well, i think that's a pretty good compliment <laughs> you know because there are days when i felt like you know i just can't ride another another pedal there are days there were days when you know well riding up 11,312 oh, wow. feet um of uh, to the top of of donner pass there you know, getting to the top long after everybody. And some people didn't ride it. You know, I was pretty slow um, riding four miles an hour. Some of that, I thought I was going to be there till midnight. Um, come, I forgot coming down the other side. We got up to 45 miles an hour. And wahoo, is that exciting? <laughs> um, on a bicycle on a curvy road, wow. if you can imagine. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> Frightening. Yeah, and, and holding uh. on the brakes for dear life because I was too afraid to go any faster than 45 miles. Some uh. of the guys got up to 50. Um, but, you know, getting to the top of that and bursting into tears because there's this beautiful snow-capped mountains in August, or in, in July, I guess it was. Beautiful snow-capped mountains and a big lake, and oh, it was so oh. gorgeous. And I just sort of burst into tears Aww. because, you know, You've been working really hard at four miles an hour for hours and hours and hours and hours mm. thinking, I'm never going to get there. You know, so having many experiences like that was, was thrilling, you know, <laughs> and accomplishing that, you know, saying, you know, these two legs and these two arms did that, you know, mm. and a lot of stubbornness, you know, saying, well, if somebody else can do this, I can too, you know. So what do you say to yourself when you're, um, I have, a, when I do running or anything like that, I, this is weird, but I always go, cup of tea, cup of tea, because I always think I'll have a cup of tea when I get home. <laughs> so I, and it keeps my rhythm going. Yeah, yep. You yep, know, we no. all have our things. Mm -hmm. So what did you, did well, you recite Shakespeare? Or uh, what? I sang a lot. Mm. Um, and writing is a pretty... Were they hymns that you sang? Uh, I, I sang every Girl Scout song I ever knew. I know a million rounds. I sang every hymn I know. <laughs> I sang... My parents sang to me when I was a little girl, and we sang huh. as a family a bit. So I sang, you know, all the parts to mm -hmm. different rounds, you know. Good thing there weren't people around me <laughs> all the time. It's but a good way to get breath, too. Absolutely. Singing was a great, yeah. it was a great time. And um, the other thing that's been my mantra, and is often when I run, is saying the Lord's Prayer mm. over and over again. Um, and then I'm, because I'm a Christian scientist, we have a, another interpretation of that, um, saying that together and just really thinking really hard about what that means. Um, that was a real help for me just kind of at times when you're thinking, oh, I just can't do this anymore. Well, since you mentioned it, um, you are a Christian scientist. Mm -hmm. Tist, is Tist, that what we say? Yes. So how do you think believing in Christian science helps to make you who you are? Because it's a specific religion mm -hmm. that not too many people are involved in. Mm -hmm. And it has, you know, certain beliefs that a lot of other religions don't. You know, I think having a very strong belief in God, um, I said when I was in my abusive relationship, it kept me in because I worked hard at healing it, but it also kept me alive it, because I knew that there was something greater than me. There was something that was helping me, guarding me, guiding me, 
Um, and when I didn't have any more strength, um, then, you know, I just really realized that I'm a child of God. That means I reflect God. And God doesn't feel weak. God doesn't feel um, like they're tired. God doesn't get tired one someday and say, I think I'll take a nap. Um, you know, God takes care of us. And so having that real strong, clear belief, I think, really helped me survive through lots of things in my life that otherwise... You know, I, I did, I've spent a lot of my life being pretty angry about injustice. Um, but, you know, letting that go in my more mature year, years and turning that over to God more has really been helpful to me and, and made me feel, realizing that anger is not the only thing that should fuel my thinking, you know, and, and it's not really a very good quality to hold on to. It sometimes keeps you from folding up, but in the end, there's better, much nicer qualities than that that one can live with. One of the things that we know about Christian science is that you don't get medical attention, mm -hmm. right? You let well, it it's important. It, yeah. It's important to say that, that we believe in healing. Um, we believe in the same healings that, you know, Jesus came to us and showed us healing, and we just believe Jesus came to show us how to do that. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we can't use medicine if we don't. Wish there's nothing that says we're excommunicated if we go to a doctor or a dentist. And every Christian scientist makes their own choices every day about how they're going to practice their religion in every circumstance. So, but I'm I'm wondering if that sort of contributes to your stubbornness and your sense of um, mission that somehow. Yeah. You're the you're the captain of your ship, or something. Using those sorts of metaphors, that there's a, a strength that you mm -hmm. must have to go it yeah. alone, or something. I, I would certainly say that. You know, I've I have three sisters. I'm the oldest of four women, and we are all strikingly strikingly um, independent. I, and I've, I've often sort of wondered, well, what did my parents do to raise these four really independent daughters? You know, we grew up in the 50s when being independent women was probably not right. um, really encouraged. Um, and my mother was pretty much a traditional 50s wife um, in certain ways. But, you know, my dad died fairly young. And I realized the strength that my mother, my mother was probably really the strength of that relationship that I didn't see as as a child necessarily. Um, but, an, and I think that my dad had some really non-traditional ways of believing even in the fifties in that, you know, if you can start the lawn more than you can mow the lawn, um, just like I can, you know, I often just got encouraged. I really never knew that women were different than men in terms of strength, that sort of thing. Um, you know, certainly I knew women had different roles, but I think I was encouraged to do a lot of things. And, and my father cooked and um, arranged the flowers because he owned a plant nursery. So he did a lot of things that maybe might be con considered traditionally female or feminine. Um, so it gave me a sense of balance. Hmm. Um, and I do believe that, um, you know, being raised in a religion that was founded by a woman um, oh, a I woman, didn't know that. yes, Mary Baker Eddy is the founder of Christian Science, founded by a woman um, who founded the Christian Science Monitor when she was 87 years old. Hmm. You know, was really a, an astonishing. I mean, it was a great role model for all of us who grew up as as young women in this faith. So it did give me the strength, and it was always, you know, as I moved around all those old places when I was a young woman, kind of all by myself, there was always a church to go to, always the connection to the church. When I lived in Chicago, I was a VISTA volunteer, and there's a great picture of me. Um, I went to church there, and we got paid, I think, $120 a month, which even then was pretty low pay. Um, and... So, you know, I didn't have a lot of clothes, and I remember, and when I left Chicago, the women in the church held a tea party for me, an afternoon tea. They were tea. all dressed in their, yep, cup of tea. They were all dressed in their beautiful suits, um, and, you know, that was, back when women were poured, I mean, were, it was quite formal, and I had a muumuu on. 
<laughs> it was the only dress I think I owned because I didn't have much in the way of shoes. I didn't. I had. I mostly. I worked with kids, and they wanted us to dress like kids, you know. So I had jeans and T-shirts, and um, and the muumuu was the only thing I had that was kind of dressy. Um, and so, and it's a great picture of me and all these lovely ladies in silver tea service, and me and a muumuu. Um, <laughs> But that's what I had at the time, and that's what I wore. But that's kind of tells you. But they, you know, I had the the love and the support of those church members while I was out. My title at those in those days, I was a Vista volunteer. My title was street worker. Now I have to work so hard to say it right because it was street <laughs> worker, um, which meant that we had we were assigned neighborhoods and we had to work with the kids that were in that neighborhood and we had to figure out they hung out. I I hung out at the Jack in the Box because that's where the kids in my neighborhood hung out. Um, but so, you know, and we were supposed to, you know, I was all of, what, 26 years old anyway. Mm-hmm. So we were supposed to look like the kids. But we weren't too much older than them anyway. But yeah. huh. it, the church has been kind of that grounding for me, I think, through a lot of my life. So back to our town, St. Petersburg. How do you see um, the work you do here um, as contributing to our city? Yeah. I mean, why do we want you here? <laughs> I don't know, do you? Um, um, I think I see the work. One of the things that's been wonderful for me in getting into doing this work is we, I got in pretty close to the beginning of um, the work. And so there were no roadmaps. There was nothing. There was no somebody that had done it before us. There were no mentors. There was nobody. So we kind of made it up as we went along. Mm-hmm. You know, we'd look at each other and go, have you ever talked to a legislator before? No, I've never talked to a legislator. Do you think we can change the law? I don't know. Yeah, let's go do it. You know, and we did. You know, we learned how to do that. We changed laws. You know, and when I get discouraged, I can think back on what it was like when I first trained police officers that, you know, just go tell Joe to walk around the block because there weren't any laws that they could arrest Joe. They, there weren't any things that the police, there were no tools for the police to do anything. You know, so... There we, weren't any? There, no, when I first started doing this work, which would have been in the early 80s, there, there was a huge privacy law in, in the state of Florida. And so police officers could go to the front door and knock at it. And if he an- answered it, they couldn't force their ways in, their way in really, because it was a private home. And they had no right to do that. You know, we've changed the law significantly now. So, so even if they saw the woman beat well, up? They, they didn't see the woman because no, they only see. got past it. They didn't get past the front door. I and see. even if they did, they saw the woman beat up. But it was a private matter. It was something that mm-hmm. somebody was entitled to do in a private home that nobody could really, you know, the, the rules were if, if, if there was a bar, bar room brawl, well, that there was laws around. But if they found out that I was in a relationship with somebody that I was in that fight with, well, oh, well, not, not my business. Hmm. The police suddenly couldn't do anything. And what can the police do now? Well, now, um, you know, there's, there's uh, what we call, and Florida has what's called a preferred arrest law. So they, the police call, are called in. They can look to see if there is an obvious perpetrator and an obvious victim, and they can arrest the perpetrator. Um, they do that by interviewing both parties, list, looking to the, what's around and trying to make it. You know, when we first passed that law, however, what we were finding is police were arresting both because um, sometimes women do fight back, in fact, believe it or not. Oh, my. Um, and so, so if he had an injury on it, then, oh, good, we can arrest them both and let the judge figure it out. Well, if you're a victim of domestic violence and you just went to jail, mm-hmm. are you ever going to call the police again? Not on, not on my life. I would never call the police again. So we had, to, we had to then pass what we call a primary aggressor law. So the police and te- train the police to recognize um, defensive wounds. In other words, if he's got um, scratch marks on his back, how did he get those? Well, he didn't get it because she ran after him with her fingernails out. Um, probably he could have run faster than she. He, he got that because he was choking her and that was all she could reach or he was holding her down. He could, she could reach his back and get him off of her. Um, so those are the kinds of injuries um, that we would, you know, teach police to recognize bruising, for instance, um, evidence in the eyes when strangulation is a very common um, practice among abusers. And hmm. sometimes those bruises don't show up right when the police come. So we had to recognize bloodshot eyes, for instance, something called petechia um, the, in the eyes that would might show up 
immediately if, if she'd been strangled. So we've learned over the years to create laws. We, we, the, the primary, you know, we had to create the primary aggressor law so that they wouldn't arrest the victim. Um, we've had to, we've created civil, civil laws, injunctions for protection or restraining orders as they're known in other places so that survivors could go and just, because women said, you know, I don't want them arrested. I just want them to stop doing this, <laughs> you know? Um, and sometimes we had to say, well, one way to get him to stop is to arrest him um, and help her see that process. Um, so we've had to create all those laws. So that's part of what I've been part of. And, and now I think, you know, one of the things that if anybody had told me 20 years ago that I would have so many men involved with this, I would have said, nope, mm -hmm. that'll never happen. Because when I used to get invited to speak every once in a while to a Rotary Club, First of all, they'd introduce me to their one female member, who's usually secretary, um, and say, we have a woman member here. Um, and they would all sort of mm. wait for me to sort of accuse them, accuse them all of being bad people. You know, um, now men realize that good men don't want, are not violent, mm -hmm. that there are many good men in the community and that they can be part of the solution. So, you know, Fast forward 23 years later, we have a peace breakfast that has more than half men come to that event every year. We have, you know, our board of directors is at least half men. We have many men involved with us who said, and, and we found that some of those men grew up in homes where there was violence. And they said, you know, that's just, this is never going to happen again. I want to make sure this doesn't happen to my daughters. This doesn't happen to my sister. This doesn't happen to anybody I know. So I want to make a difference. I want to make sure that that, that, that this isn't just the way that everybody thinks all men are, because we don't think that. You know, most of us love men, you know, and, you know, after 20 years, I got married a year and a half ago, you know, so um, people said, really? Why? Um, <laughs> some of my friends did. Um, but, you know, it's been a joyous occasion. Um, this time I did a little better than the first time around. Um, when you were... Um getting these laws passed, mm -hmm. was that easy? Was there resistance to this? Or did you just go, oh, we think this should happen? And they said, oh, oh there yes, was, Linda. <laughs> oh, well, there was lots of resistance. And, you know, the best lobbyists out there were, in fact, the wives of the elected officials that, that helped us get some of those laws passed and are still some of our greatest allies. We don't have money to pay, pay a fancy lobbyist, but the women are out there. The pillow talk is really sometimes more powerful than all the money you can pay to a lobbyist. Hmm. Um, and yes, there was resistance. There was fear. There was a sense of, well, you know, what if the police come out and arrest my friend? Because domestic violence is an equal opportunity destroyer. It doesn't have really an economic um, boundary. It's not just poor people. It's not just um, uh, unreligious people. It's not just um, uneducated people. It is anybody who can be a victim or a perpetrator in our society. They are, I mean, they don't have real, they, don't, they cross all those kind of different lines. We always like to think that it's somebody that doesn't look like me who lives in some other neighborhood. But, and yes, at CASA in the shelter, we serve poor women for the most part because poor women don't have a credit card that they can go stay in a motel with. Mm -hmm. They don't have friends that have an extra bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, poor women live in apartments and housing that's very close together. And so most domestic violence isn't, violence isn't reported by the victim. It's reported by the neighbors. It's reported by people that hear it. Hmm. So if you live in a big house on a hill, there's nobody around to hear. So that's why sometimes hmm. victims appear, you know, because, and because women who live in the house on the, whole, on the hill, um, sometimes there's different ways to be abusive of people when you have more money. Mm. Um, you know, I can sit here today and say I know a judge that abuses his wife. And I don't have permission to tell you who that is because his wife's still living there. I know, I know a police officer. I know a doctor. And I know a former city council person. So these are all people that we know and are recognized in our community as upstanding citizens who use violence in order to control their families. Mm -hmm. So it's endemic throughout society, and we have, to, we have a lot of work to do. Unfortunately, I'll probably have a job until I'm 100 if I wanted it. Um, 
to really help people understand that there's another way to solve problems besides violence. So let's say that I were in an abusive relationship, mm -hmm. which I'm not. <laughs> but but he, my poor husband now worries if I if I fall off my bike and get right. injured that people are going to think that he's abusing me. So so it's tough being married to me. You know. I mean, I want to be married. I want my you know. Oh, I want my this idea that my husband loves me and da 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 da. So what does it take for me mm -hmm. to actually? make that step to go um, to CASA, to the woman's shelter. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine it's the first time yeah. my husband hits me mm -hmm. or my boyfriend or whomever. What is it that, what's the straw that breaks the camel's back? What is it that gets me to make that, which means, could mean I'm not married anymore, right? Could mean I don't have a place to live could mean, you know, my whole life is radically, I'm not having my job anymore. I may not have my kids, you know. That, it's such a big thing. I mean, what is it that gets me to do that? It's very different for each woman. Mm. Um, sometimes for some women it is when they watch their four-year-old talk to them like his daddy talk, talk to you like his daddy talks to you when the four-year-old is already being used to perpetuate the violence. Mm. When a four, you know, in our shelter, we have four-year-old little boys who come into shelter and who don't know a nice man, and, they're no, and they know they're going to grow up to be a man. Um, that's sometimes the impetus for some women. For others, it is a friend just saying, you know, you don't need to have this happen to you. I can help. For some, it is, you know, it's waking up one day and saying, this is just not right, you know, and, or, and, and seeing some kind of an option. You know, the options we offer for women are not all that great. You know, you get to leave your house in the middle of the night without taking any of your clothes and not having access to money and taking your three little kids who, to a strange place called yeah. a shelter and, um, and you don't know where that is and you're going to be hidden and you can't tell anybody where you're going and, um, oh boy, isn't that going to be fun? Yeah. You know, so if you imagine what courage it takes for a woman to finally say, wow, this is too much. Um, and for each individual, some, you know, women always say, well, the first time he hit me, I'd, I'd leave. Would you? You've got a mortgage together. Mm -hmm. You've got a house together. You've got children together. You've got a bank account together. You have a car together and a boat and all those other things that we accumulate. Plus you have shame. And you have and shame and, and embarrassment and, and your mother who said, I told you so, or who's going to say, I told you so or your dad, or somebody like that, and you've got, you've got all of that to consider. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I leave, I don't know how I'm going to feed my kids. Yeah. That, it's that simple. It's basic bottom line, you know, for even for, for women that appear to have lots of means, mm -hmm. um, when they walk out of the house, they may not be sure how they're going to feed their kids. Mm -hmm. That bottom line is really hard, but you know, so somewhere along the line, you sort of figure out it's going to be worse if I stay than it's going to be if I leave. But I will, how do you even know where to go? I mean, how well, do you? you know, we find do our out? very we do our very best to get the word out there. We talk to employers, we talk to hmm. we talk to friends, we talk to family. But you know, in we've studied these domestic homicides. And almost always, out of a, we've looked at 100, more than 100 domestic homicides now um, over the past 10 years or so in Pinellas County. Almost always friends and family knew when they just didn't know what to do. Well, now you're all friends and family. If you have a friend or somebody that knows, you know, you can call us and ask for help. You can, you can call us and ask for how do I work with my friend. That if, if there's nothing else you can do to help, just call us and we'll tell you what things you can try. So that's part of it is, is knowing that you know, and it, you know, domestic violence is not a private matter. It's not something that's really none of your business. It's going to affect you. It's already affected your children, most, most likely. It affects you as an employer. It affects you as, you know, as a community member. It affects us in so many ways that we don't always acknowledge. You know, so part of it is, is, is 
reaching out to people that you think might be survivors and say, you know, you don't deserve this. You know, there's help. There's something you can do. Um, and if somebody chooses you to tell their story to, my goodness, believe them. Because so many women tell us, I told my story to my minister. And he said, go home, stay married, be a better wife, and it'll end. Mm -hmm. And I went home and I got beaten almost to death. You know, so we have to believe the story that a woman tells you. Um, because most likely it's happened before. Most likely, this isn't the worst story. This is just the most recent. Most likely, this is you're going to be the person that she chose for whatever reason that she can trust. So believing their story is, is one of the very first things you can do. And, you know, and then being patient because, you know, we women are, are independent. And we, may, we know in the most common time when a woman is killed is when she tries to leave because she, doesn't, she needs a safety plan. And abuse is about power and control, and he thinks he's lost control. Mm -hmm. So that's the most dangerous time for her. So we have to really create a safety plan for her, and she's got to feel like she has some choices before she can leave. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's, it's every individual, you know, some people stay for 18 years, some people stay for 18 months. So does this get to you? I mean, are there times when you just, I mean, so some women come to the, to the shelter, but that means probably 20 times women don't, right? That's right, right. And this keeps, you know, going on and on and on. So, I mean, are there some days, is that why you get on your bicycle, that you just feel like, you know, There's sometimes what am I going to do? My coworkers say, you need to go ride a bike. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm being that crispy, huh? Um, but the reality is, is that mostly this is incredibly empowering work because you watch women do incredibly powerful things and do courageous, mm. take, take courageous stands. And so most of the time, it's just rewarding every day watching people take control, take charge, make these dramatic decisions in their lives and then come back a year or two or five years or 10 years later and say, look where I am now. Look what I've done. You know, that, oh, I mean, it's just such a reward for those of us who do this work. But even just a little courage that it takes, I try to remind her what it take, took to get her to where she is now and that she can take that same courage and get free. Um, so so there, that's rewarding. And yes, there are days when I'm discouraged. And yes, there are days when I feel angry. But that's when, you know, that's why we work in community. That's why I have lots of sisters and brothers that do this work with me. Um, that's why I now have a safe home that's very nurturing to go home to. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's why I have a great group of friends, some great friends out there who, who, I don't have to talk about this stuff, too. I can talk about cycling. I can talk about books. I can talk about lots of other things with. Um, so it, you know, that's how you survive through this and, and really create in the sense of balance so that this is not, you're not living and breathing and sleeping this stuff all the time. So one thing that our city does is it gives you some grant money mm -hmm. to help run your program. Mm -hmm. um, why does the city do that? Why do they use our valuable tax dollars <laughs> to uh, give to For you? For those of you that don't like paying taxes, well, some of your taxes go to fund programs like CASA. You know, in Europe, when um, I've traveled there and I've met with a number of different domestic violence programs over there, they're always absolutely surprised that we have to raise money from the community because their programs are paid for by tax dollars. Um, that's government. That's what they expect government to do for them. In this country, we think that government should not necessarily do that. But, well, now we're saying, well, maybe the faith-based community. Well, you know, many faith-based organizations are struggling to pay their own light bill. Um, so it, not necessarily the faith-based community um, that's going to support us either. So some of our support, you know, we were about 75% grant public grant funded from federal, state, and city grants. Now we're, that's moved down to about 50% um, because this state doesn't like to pay taxes. So for us and the many nonprofits out there, the good nonprofits that cover and lots of things, you as we as a community have to decide what kind of community we want to live in and what we want to make sure is, is um, people, how, how do we take care of our community? 
And so we have to decide, we have to vote with our tax dollars, we have to vote with our own pocketbooks, which organizations are important to stay around in our community so that, so that we can end the scourge of domestic violence, so that we can end many of the, of the diseases that we, we work about, we could, so that we can end you know, um, drug abuse and, and child abuse and all of the other social problems that, that really affect all of us. We want to live in a community that, that sees that we can express more love in. We have to figure out how to do that together. It's not, not it's just, you know, this whole problem of domestic violence is just not a problem that happens in couples. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen just to that couple because of that's what she said and so she shouldn't have argued with him. It happens when women get together and start talking about their abusers, they, they look at each other and think, gosh, we sound like we're married to the same guy. Because it's so similar, because the characteristics of abusers are so similar. There's such learned behavior that, that, and as a community, we give permission for that behavior to occur by allowing it. So we have, a, have to have a job as a community to say, well, that's not a community I want to live in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in a community where some of my neighbors are getting beaten up or where some of my children are paying, playing with somebody who's getting beaten up by, I don't want to live in that community. So... That's why we decide so, to, as taxpayers, to pay for programs like CASA or as individuals. You talk about the perpetrators as it's learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So can these people unlearn that behavior? Can, is it possible for families to reunite or is that really uncommon? And what happens to the perpetrator? Yeah. I mean, how, I mean, it seems like, okay, so the woman goes away, but if this guy is still the same way, then there'll be another woman who takes the slot or he goes to prison. So if that person could be unlearned, right. it would be better for all of us. Well, is that possible? That's, I think it is possible. Um, we have what we call batters intervention programs, BIPs for short, BIP. Um, and the court has the ability to order individuals into these programs. They're 26-week programs, not because 26 weeks is a magic cure, but because that's the longest in Florida. You can keep somebody who's been sentenced with a misdemeanor charge pretty much the longest time we can get. So it's get. only a misdemeanor if you beat someone um, up? It's a misdemeanor unless you use a weapon or unless you um, create um, permanent damage. So, and so fists you can, aren't weapons. fists are not considered weapons um, in most cases. Uh, and so unless you pick up a weapon, um, you know, What's any a weapon? a weapon, a gun, it most likely knives. most, most common women are killed with guns, um, but knives, guns, baseball bats, um, lamps, hmm. frying pans, you know, whatever's available, all those can be weapons um but and if you use a weapon then then that it can then it can be raised to a felony um or if you create with your fist damage that that is um permanent but probably putting someone like that in jail doesn't breaking help. breaking my jaw is not a felony that would be a misdemeanor mm -hmm. um yeah because the jaw will heal um the emotional scars on the other hand you know i think it's really important to remember that Physical violence doesn't occur very much in, in it's not as common as, as we see on TV. It's really, you know, the, it's much harder to heal from the broken heart than it is to mm -hmm. heal from the broken arm. Um, it takes a lot longer. So, I, you know, there's lots of community involvement. You know, going to jail um, doesn't really cure the batterer, right. um, the abuser. Um, it says we don't approve of what you're doing. But we need to do more. Um, I don't have a great lot of hope for a relationship. Once the first fist is thrown, um, I don't have a great lot of hope for that relationship ever developing the kind of trust it takes to have a, a real healthy relationship ever again. Mm -hmm. What I do have hope is that this abuser does can go to Batter's Intervention Program, can learn that there's another way to have a relationship and can get in another relationship that's healthier. And have you seen success? Oh, we've seen some, yes. And, you know, there's some research um, out there that indicates that Batter's Intervention Programs do are, you know, we're talking about people here. We're not talking about widgets. Um, and people can choose to make changes or they can choose not to. So, so in that 26 weeks, some people do make some changes. Um, some people don't. 
You know, that's not, there's no magic. Mm -hmm. There's no magic pill um, to this. There's no magic cure. Um, but, you know, some individuals realize that, well, I want to be in a family. I want to have a wife. Um, this didn't work out so well the first time. Maybe I need to do something different. Mm -hmm. So there is some hope, and I do this work with that hope in mind, that we can change people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes a lot of community pressure. You know, as we as a community think it's funny to make jokes about, you know, I'll go home and beat my old lady tonight, um, and we laugh. Not so funny for a, a woman that's being mm -hmm. on the other end of that. Um, you know, and the, you know, the old caveman cartoons, you know, with Thor walking along, pulling his wife by the hairs of her head. Funny, maybe, for some people, but really a reality for some survivors of domestic violence that that's happened to them. Um, so we have to really think about what we think is funny um, about women, um, what we think is funny about our lives, um, we have to really reevaluate that and look at um, what we're saying when we laugh at some of those kinds of... It's really remarkable to me. Um, I've been to one of these breakfasts, and it's packed, and that so many people come to support something that, in a way, is secret and unspeakable, mm -hmm. but and yet there are so many people who you know, are so grateful that this work gets done. Um, and, you know, a lot, all of the abuse gets done in secret, not always, but it's just so fascinating, the, the sort of dynamics of how community works and all the different aspects. Um, and, I mean, it's... Well, I, I think, you know, people see signs of it, you know, in their families, they see it in their neighborhoods. Um, and a surprising number of people in that audience, people that you know grew up in homes where they, mm -hmm. they witnessed abuse and want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. You know, it's, it's always about power. It's always about control that really is. And, and violence is just one of the tools to maintain control. You know, I, I think I shared an example with you. You know, most, you know, an abuser, most abusers have jobs just like we do. Um, they go to work every day, and probably there are times when their bosses say or do things that make them mad. They don't hit their bosses because mm -hmm. they can't get away with that. We as a community wouldn't accept that. They would lose their jobs. There would be consequences that would make a difference to them. But they go home, and, you know, abuse isn't really about anger. It's about control. And it, the violence is, about, is a tool to achieve control. And so abusers go home and they feel entitled to have control of their wives, their children, and they threaten violence. And usually that's about all it takes because, and maybe one or two smacks or one or two kicks or one or two, and in some cases, some terrible violence. And then sometimes all it takes is a raised eyebrow or the look that women talk about. Sometimes mm -hmm. I knew how he would be by how he walked, he closed the door of his car and walked up the sidewalk. I could tell whether tonight was going to be a good night or a bad night. That's what we hear. Mm -hmm. That's a really good, good example. The boss and the, yeah, it's really telling. Um, okay. So does anyone in the audience have a question? Yes. Would you please stand up and say your name and, oh, wait a second. We have a, um, Microphone. microphone here. That way here it gets comes recorded. Vanna. As you all know, this gets recorded and it's posted on YouTube. And so having the mic gets you on. Just what I wanted. <laughs> Linda, thank you so much. My name is Ann Drake McMullen. And actually, Linda and I have share some time together on a couple of boards we serve on. Linda, the question I'd ask of you is two things. Um, number one, what can we do to help? And number two, do you have room? for all the women that come to you to serve? Oh, was that a set-up question? I didn't even pay her. Um, in okay. fact, our shelter has 30 beds, and we run pretty much full all the time, we have for about the last four or five years. This last year, we turned away 700 women um, and an equal number of children, so that's 1,400 individuals from and our where shelter. Where do they go? They go to their families. They go to... We, we 
we counsel them, you know, call your, can you stay with your uncle for a few days? Sometimes we can get them into homeless shelters. Sometimes um, we help them go leave town. Um, but what our goal is, in fact, we're just about ready to, we, we hope to build a much larger shelter. Um, we have less shelter in this county, for instance, than is over in Hillsborough, which is comparable about in size. We have about 40 beds less. So are, we're hoping to build a, a bigger shelter, about 100 beds. We're going to have to raise close to $10 million to be able to build that shelter and have the endowment set aside so that, so that we have the money set aside to pay for the expenses, extra expenses of a larger program with uh, needing more staff. So we're working on that right now. It's pretty exciting. In fact, um, we found a piece of land, which I won't tell you where it is because it's all supposed to be secret, although it's pretty hard, you know, I think our current shelter, I figure maybe a thousand people a year know where, find out where our shelter is. And this would have been that same location 25 years. 25,000 people and their best friends know where our shelter is. So in an urban community, it's hard to be in a secret location. But we're working right now to build a bigger shelter. Um, you know, we're, we have some state dollars that we're applying for that might be a couple of that. That's 10 millions. That, um, but we're really actively um, creating a community of of survivors that we can really help in a better way and provide a, a safer place and not have to turn away folks that come running to us in the middle of the night and we have to say to them, sorry, there's no room at the end. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Who else has a question? Yes, so will you please stand up and say your name? I'm Marla Smeckler. How long can the abused stay with you and where do they go from there? Right. That's a really good question. Um, we have a 45-day shelter, so in fact, we encourage women to stay and can stay. They can stay for about 45 days. You know, on the 45th day, we don't turn them out on the street. We, on the from the day they come in, we start working with them on safety planning. Start working to them about what their goals are, what their plan is. Sometimes some can go stay with their family. Sometimes we can help them get a plane ticket to go. Go, you know, I remember some years ago putting a woman and three children under the age of five on a bus to go all the way across the country um, to California where she had family. And I don't believe in these things, but you know those leashes that you can put little kids on? We actually got her leashes because she had a two-year-old that, and she just didn't have enough arms to hold on to all those kids. So we actually got her one of those leashes just to make sure that those kids didn't get hit by a bus on that trip. And she made it all the way across. Mm -hmm. So, so... We help people. We have um, what we call, it's, it's uh, short-term permanent housing where they can stay for up to two years. We have 14 units there, so some women can go into that, that housing called Casa Gateway. Um, some women just manage to, you know, when they come to us, they sometimes women come to us more than once. Um, statistically, women leave five to seven times. Hmm. First few times they go to their family, they go to their friends, they go to their neighbors. Um, until they've kind of burned all those bridges. Um, when they finally come to us, they've often left a number of times. Um, some, you know, in 45 days, you've got to figure out a job, you've got to figure out housing, you've got to figure out childcare, um, you've got to figure out a lot. And it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength um, for individuals that, that have been really kept, um, sometimes prisoners in their own home for many years. Um, so it is a process, and we work with the women in their process, and we, our goal is, you know, to help her make the decision she wants to make, um, and she'll come to say, well, what should I do? And I say, well, what do you want to do? Because somebody's been telling you what to do. Now it's your choice, and that's overwhelming for somebody who's been telling her what to do for a long time. So we have to really help empower them to be able to, they have free choice. They have, the choices aren't very good, though, you know? If she's not worked for a while, she may not have education. She may not have, you know, a good job history. Abusers encourage their wives to go out and work, and then they call the office 25 times a day so she loses her job. So that, that kind of messes up her job history. Um, so there are many hurdles to overcome, that, that, um, but we really work with them very closely to try to overcome those. And we sometimes have to bite our lips when she says, I'm going to go back and try it again. Um, mm. One of the things that we do is we try to help them develop what I call a community of support. So if that is their faith community, we try to reconnect them with that faith community. If, they, if it's the people they meet in the shelter that they can move in with together, that community, or if it's somebody they've got friends or family that are supporting them, then we'd really try to encourage connecting them. Because, you know, if the more we stay connected, 
the less likely that we're going to be isolated by this abuse in the first place. So it, that's, that's one of the most important things about creating community and having community support is that, you know, abusers isolate their victims. They don't get to talk to other people. They don't know this isn't normal sometimes. It's kind of, you know, turning the, the burner up just a little bit at a time mm -hmm. you know, that until the water starts to boil. They're living in that water that's just getting warmer and warmer and learning to cope with it. Yeah. You know. How, I mean, I would take it that it's a secret. Mm. Is it hard to start speaking? Yeah. It is hard because you feel ashamed. You feel like, what's there about me that made this happen? Um, you're getting blamed. You're getting um, told that it's your fault. You're getting told... Um, that you did something wrong and you made a mistake. Well, how many in this audience have ever made a mistake, you know? Mm. Um, we've all made mistakes. Does that mean you get beat up for it? I don't think so. Um, and so, but she often blames herself. She believes that it's her fault. That's what the abuser plays into. Um, and so she really is, you know, uh, doesn't really think that she is a worthy person by the time, because abusers say you're stupid, you're ugly, you're a bad wife, you're a bad mother. And remember, this is the person that loves her that says it's better. So it's pretty confusing. Mm -hmm. And important to remember that abuse doesn't happen all the time in any relationship. So there are good times. And that's, you know, we're hopeful people. That's what we hang on to. It's one of the good times. That's the guy I married is the good guy, you know, and then this other person comes out that I don't, that I don't understand, you know, but maybe it's my fault that he's coming out. So it's very complicated. It's, it's, it's not, you know, I always say, you know, if somebody comes to rob a bank, nobody says to the banker, well, how did you, why did you have money there? <laughs> why, you know, why didn't, why did you open your doors? Um, why, why did, why were you available? Well, you know, to a battered woman I say, well, you know, why did you argue with him? Why were you dressed that way? Why did you burn the dinner? Um, you see, and so as it's very hard to try these cases in court because the wonderful thing about the human mind is, is that, you know, it gets, we don't remember the horrible things that happened to us very well. It gets fuzzy. We're not very good witnesses because we want to remember the hopeful things, the good things that happened. Who else has a question? Yes. Will you please stand up in the back and um, say your name and ask your question, please? Wonderful. What percentage of people that come to you from the armed sexual assault survivors in the university have that? And if so, specifically among that demographic, what advice would you give to them? Sure. I can't see you back there, so you might as well be my age. <laughs> but I'll uh, I'd say, well, first, let me, let me sort of do this. Um, about 70% of sexual assaults occur, um, the perpetrator is somebody that they know. And so domestic violence and sexual assaults are very closely interacted. In fact, almost all survivors of domestic violence will talk. I, I consider, you know, we call it sexual assault. We have all these other euphemisms. Rape, um, for rape. Rape occurs when somebody asks you or forces you to have sex in a time or a place or in a way that you don't want. That's rape. Um, and... So most survivors of domestic violence have been raped by their partners. Um, and I would say that, you know, in the dating relationships that are occurring in college, um, you know, it's, it's, you're more likely to be raped by somebody you know than by stranger rape. We spend a lot of time talking about, you know, the guy that's going to jump out of the bushes and get you. That's only 30% of rape. 70% is by somebody you know um, and somebody you're dating. Do, do we have merit, a great deal of contact with the university community here? Not a great deal. Do they come to our shelters? Not very often for a number of reasons. One, because there are some good programs that we work with on, at the university level um, that, that help sexual assault survivors. Um, we work closely with the sexual assault programs. In, in Florida, the sexual assault programs are 
are one and the same with the domestic violence programs in most of the rural areas of the state and the urban areas were, were two separate programs. So this being urban, there's a sexual assault program that's a, a different program from CASA, but we work quite well together and closely together um, and recognize that there's a great deal of overlap. Again, a lot of it has the same you know, origins of devaluing women and thinking that women can be used as chattel. So I don't know if that really answered your question, but. So um, time is up. So, um, you know, one thing about this Our Town, it's the first Our Town that um, we've had that really addresses an issue that's pretty intense and um, unsettling. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's an unsettling topic, and for me, it's a very unsettling. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's, it's uplifting to know that our community, our town, um, provides and supports um, CASA and other um, institutions to um, facilitate this not being the case in our community or anywhere else. Um, and oftentimes, I think it's so important for us to really be, um, like, really aware that this is going on and lucky that we have people like Linda and the people you work with and all your volunteers who address these issues and work with them that we you know, don't and don't want to like really, you know, mess with it, you know. And, um, you know, it's really difficult. And, but it's part of our town. It's part mm -hmm. of our identity, not just the good stuff. And I find this, um, you know, I'm, I'm realizing grappling with this. So, um, I'm really, I have to say, I'm really appreciative that you came and I'm appreciative how, what, you know, the listening from the audience is really important to me. It helps me so much when I'm up here. And so, um, so let's um, thank Linda. <laughs> And um, please come next month, um, June 27th. It's always the last Thursday of every month. And I can't tell you who the guest is going to be because things have gotten changed around. So um, you'll have to come and see the mystery guest. If I could, if I could embarrass him for a moment, I'd like to introduce my husband. I was three oh, was quarters of the way back there. He's ah. here, Morris Kurtz. Yay! <laughs> And he's a good guy. He's, I got one of the good ones. <laughs> Thank you.